Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another live stream for History Valley Podcast. Today I'm joined by Professor John Dalman Crossan. Today we're discussing his book, How to Read the Bible and Still Be a Christian. Is God Violent? So today we're just we're going to be talking about the issue with uh, with God, a big a big debate involving is God just or is he unjust? Is is the God character in the Bible? A good person whether he exists or not is a different question so welcome back to the show dom well the bible i'm talking about the one i know best is what we call the christian bible the one that begins with genesis and ends with revelation and when you ask that question you know you usually think in a story <clears throat> excuse me in a story the the climax, the grand finale comes in the last chapter. If you're watching a television story and all of a sudden your television goes dead in the last 15 minutes, <laughs> you figure you've lost the climax of the whole thing. So if anyone reads the Christian Bible and they get to the book of Revelation, the kindest thing you can say about it is it's a wash in blood. The, the whole world is a wash in blood. And it seems very much like it's a wash because God is washing it in blood. The great analogy is that, you know, you're threading the, out the grapes, but it's human beings that God is threading out. So the wine press of God's wrath is now filled up with grapes, but with human beings. So I think it's a fair conclusion from the Christian Bible that, yeah, even if every now and then it looks like God might have decided not to be violent in the grand finale in the Christian Bible, God decides, okay, I'm I'm sort of fed up with this. The final thing to do is to kill most people. If we kill most people, especially other people, then everything will be just and peaceful. There'll only be the just people left. So that's really the heart of the climax. And you don't get around it by going into some place in the Old Testament where the God of the Hebrew says, as was done in ancient warfare, sacrifice everyone, men, women, and children. Yeah, you can get around that by saying, and you should get around it by saying, they took it for granted that God wanted them to do what, what <laughs> Asher wanted the Assyrians to do. And Asher, the God of the Assyrians, was an imperial God of slaughter. So Yahweh was the same. The real question, for Christians at least, and that's why I mentioned that in the title, is what are you going to do with the book of Revelation? And what do you think um, they tend to do with the book of Revelation? Because some will say, because I'm, I'm asking this in two parts, like number one, what I just said about, what I just asked about Revelation two, some will say the New Testament God is very different from the way the Old Testament God acts? And how do you respond to those? Well, it's a very good argument, Jacob, unless you make the mistake of actually reading the Bible. It's a marvelous argument, but I, I deliberately got rid of that in the beginning because the worst book in the Bible, I, let me back up. I taught world religions for lots of years at Nepal. The worst writing I know pretty much in all the canonical literatures of at least the great religions is the Christian book of Revelation from beginning to end. And the message is quite clear in that book. Its, its theme, its thesis is that Rome, the Roman Empire, the beast, if you will, has slaughtered Christians in the immediate past, slaughtered them. I mean, you almost get the idea that the only <laughs> the only good Christian is a dead Christian as far as the Romans are concerned, and heaven is filled with them. And so, says the book, God is coming and Christ is coming back. None of this donkey business riding into Jerusalem on a peace donkey. He's coming back on a war horse and he's coming back as a slaughterer. And since the Romans slaughtered Christians, Fair enough, our God is going to slaughter them. 
that, whether we like it or not, is the message of revelation. And you can't hide behind saying, well, they call the Roman Empire the beast. Yeah, they do. Of course they do. So you have to ask yourself then, what's the book of Revelation about? And I would say one clue, if you're paying attention, is how come this book is all about the Romans and the legions are never mentioned? Surely if there's any slaughtering going on of Christians, the legions must be involved, the shock troops. Instead of which, the book of Revelation seems to be much more worried about the traders, the merchants. Seems to be far more worried about Rome, I mean the city, as the, how would I put it, the marketplace of the Mediterranean. And as you well know, you know what he calls it. He calls it the brothel of the Mediterranean because everyone's coming and going, attracted by the trade. So this is a tremendous manifesto. Don't have anything to do with the Roman Empire because it's globalization. That's the word for it. Mediterranean globalization is the great seduction. It's, it's really more worried about the seduction of the Roman Empire than the oppression of the Roman Empire. That's why you hear about merchants, but not about legions. So what we have to do is not say, well, I like it, I don't like it, I won't read it, I'll dismiss it, it shouldn't be in there, all of that stuff. Fine. What is John of Patmos doing in this book? And do we accept it as the negation of the Jesus, of the gospel, who rode into Jerusalem on the peace donkey to put an end to war, as it were? This is rebuttal. This is the Bible, the New Testament saying, well, yeah, we got all that stuff about turning the other cheek. And yeah, we know the Sermon on the Mount, but let's get real and get some Bring him back on a war horse. He, he, he didn't get it right. The book of Revelation is thoroughly dissatisfied with the incarnation. The idea of this God being revealed in Jesus and Jesus not being on a war horse, but being on a peace donkey, a donkey, a male riding a donkey, maybe even a female donkey with a little coat running along beside her. How undignified. We want a warrior God. So that's what he's up to. Now, if you want to read the Bible, it's in the Bible. I'm not going to say it shouldn't be in there. Ignore it. I'm saying that this is what we do from one end of the Bible to the other. We didn't start it, by the way. You have a challenge from God as I said, you've said whether God exists or not, we're talking now about the biblical God. We're talking for the moment about a person in a story. And the biblical God, again and again in the Bible, asserts something which is breathtakingly challenging. In the book of Leviticus, for example, he says, the land belongs to me. You're all tenant farmers and resident aliens. <laughs> The land belongs to God, and we're all resident aliens. We're all immigrants, if you prefer it, on this world. Wow. So I can't buy and sell land? Yep, that's what Leviticus says. It's mine. You can't buy and sell it. You can borrow it for a while. Wow. How do we get around that? The Bible is the history of our, I was going to say struggles with God, with the biblical God, it's more a sort of a rhythm of acceptance, subversion, acceptance, rejection, reacceptance, rejection. It's like it's like a heartbeat, <laughs> you know. Mm, 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 mm. So when I get to the New Testament, I'm already primed, because I know the whole tradition before that, to say, hmm, I don't see people accepting this Jesus. They may put down what he said and what he did, sure. We've always done that. 
but then we have to get rid of him. We, we, it's too hard to live with this guy. So we say what he said, but then we fix it up. Does Revelation in some way remind you of the book of Genesis when God gets really upset? He decides to flood the entire world because there's giants on it. So therefore, one can say he is killing a lot of people. Uh, he's destroying most of humanity just because of giants. So why couldn't you just destroy giants without having to flood the whole planet? Yeah, exactly. So let me take a look at that. And this refers to most of the first 11 books of of um, Genesis, 11 chapters I meant to say of Genesis. Imagine yourself in the ancient world, if you can, for a moment, even around the year 1000 BCE, 3000 years ago. Let's say you're living in Israel. It's the, the linchpin of Asia, Africa, and um, Europe, the known continents that at that time, as far as Europe was concerned, that's where you are and you have stories. You've heard the Mesopotamian stories, for example. You know a story from Mesopotamia that says, and we know it now too, because we discovered it, that once upon a time, one of the gods, let's call him the bad god for the story, the bad god was kind of annoyed because human beings were making too much noise, couldn't get a good sleep. So this bad god, let's call him, decided to kill them all. Now, pretty much human beings, I think. I don't think he was after the animals. At least, <laughs> at least he was going after the human beings. But I suppose if you flood people, you're going to kill everyone else as well, except the sharks, maybe. Anyway, then the good god, another god, because there was many gods, of course, in Mesopotamia, the good god thought this was a very bad idea. So the good god chose somebody, in this case, he wasn't called Noah, he was called Utnapishtim, but he's the same thing. He chose one person to save the human race. And what he said to this person was sort of marvelous. It could be a motto for us too. Forget possessions, save life. Don't worry about your house or anything else. Make a boat, make the ark as we call it, and save life. Save life. Now, I'm in the year 1000 BCE. Let's say I'm a scholar. I know the traditions. I know this story. What am I going to do with that story? I have no reason to say what had never happened. I haven't had an enlightenment yet, so I'm not so smart that I can say, yeah, it never happened. I think they made that one up. I, I say to myself, well, I don't believe in gods. So I don't think there was a good God and a bad God. But if this happened, and it must have happened because it says in the story, it had to be done by my God. It had to be done by Yahweh. Now, why would Yahweh ever decide to kill all the people that Yahweh had created? Which is kind of an embarrassing thing to do. It's kind of admission that you blew it by creating these people, if they turn out to be. So it's nothing to do about Yahweh needed a good nap in the afternoon and he couldn't get peace. It had to be that they were violent. <laughs> this is the great irony. <laughs> the human race had been so violent that, look at the contradiction, that God decided in an act of ultra violence to destroy it. It's like, you know, if you had a whole bunch of kids fighting one another and you decided to solve it by killing them. I mean, we do that. Not with children, but we do it in other cases, but it's called civilization. But anyway, this person said, I, this story has to be rewritten. Uh, I'll rewrite this story. God is displeased with God's own creation because of its violence. But of course, God does not want to wipe out the human race. So God chooses, here we go again, Noah. And Noah, which is the, the biblical Utnapishtim, is told to save the animals and the human race, and you know about the ark and everything else. Now, here's the fascinating thing. In the biblical story, afterwards, chapter 9 of Genesis, for I think maybe the only time in the Bible, God sort of says, I shouldn't have done that, and I'll never do it again. 
doesn't quite say, I apologize. There's nobody to apologize to except no one. He didn't get killed. But the closest you ever get in the Bible to God saying, I shouldn't have done that, is God saying, I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. So this is what I'm going to call a narrative cleanup. As a person, as a scholar, <laughs> 3,000 years ago, I know this story. I have no reason to think it didn't happen. I'm certain it didn't happen between two gods because they don't exist. So I'm trying to think, what would my God do? And afterwards, here's what counts. Would my God, as it were, say, I shouldn't have done that and never do that again. So it's a cleanup. It's the Bible cleaning up a narrative that it takes for granted. And you can, you can take that elsewhere in those chapters, but that's what's going on. These are their stories. They have no reason to think it didn't happen any more than I think the pilgrims didn't come over on the Mayflower. I, I wasn't there. <laughs> I, I just have heard the story. I take it for granted it happened. And they came on a ship, that makes sense to me. Now, if I came to came over on a whale, yeah, I might begin to suspect it. But so does it tell me that God is violent? No, it tells me that they're trying to figure out a story. And at least they come as close as they can at the end to saying, God shouldn't have done that. That ain't our God. Sages and pages, thank you for your super chat. Future destruction is announced from the get-go in the first evidence for Christianity, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Jesus is a punisher of sinners, 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. Um, I, I would think that having established the book of Revelation, you're not going to quibble about minor details, but let me just be clear, though, on 1 Thessalonians. When Paul... Paul as distinct from John of Patmos, Paul of Tarsus, John of Patmos. Each of them, each of them thought that the great climax, the great consummation of history, what we call today the end of history, would happen within their lifetime. John of Patmos thought it, so did uh, Paul of Tarsus. They both thought it. They're both wrong, by the way, off by at least 2,000 years and counting. But We've seen how John of Patmos saw it's the great slaughter. When Paul imagines, let me call it the consummation of history, he calls it a word that John of Patmos doesn't use and couldn't use. He calls it the parousia. And parousia is a technical term for a visit. It also can be used as an ordinary term for just somebody coming, but it's used especially for an imperial legate coming to take up his office, say, at Ephesus in Asia or something like that, or especially for a visit from the emperor himself. Wow. Now, what happens in a parousia? What happens during the Pax Romana when nobody in the entire Roman Empire, probably by, say, the 50s, it probably has ever experienced an emperor coming with the legions to, you know, besiege your city and flatten it. That hasn't maybe happened for quite some time. So what happens when an emperor comes to your city? First of all, it's really good news. He's going to spend a lot of cash. He's probably going to, well, yeah, you would build a triumphal arch or something, but oh, you'll get much more back. Oh, yes. You'll get much more. You might get tax exemption for five years, who knows? So you throw your gates open, if you still have gates, by the way, if, if they are, they're ceremonial, you throw your gates wide open, you dress in your best garb, at least for the, uh, the, the leaders, and you go out to meet him. To do what? To bring him into your city for congratulations, for triumph, for celebration. Now, that's why John of Patmos will never talk about anything. You talk about the coming, the coming of Christ, not the second coming, but the coming. He doesn't he'd never say the second coming because that gives the whole thing away that we're not accepting the first coming. 
So he talks about the coming. Paul talks about the parousia. Anyone in the first century reading Paul, Thessalonians, for example, would know the model is the advent of, say, the emperor for celebration and congratulations for a job well done. The difference between Paul's vision of the consummation and John's vision, totally different. Now, if you said to Paul, our evildoer is going to be punished, he'd probably say yes, but that's not what he emphasizes. That's not what he emphasizes. It is what John emphasizes, John of Patmos. So they really are the radically different alternatives in the New Testament for what's going to happen when, as we think, Jesus is going to come imminently within our lifetime. And what do you think the point was when history is rewritten in, in the Old Testament, like with uh, the whole thing about Manasseh misleading uh, Judah or King Nico of Egypt? What's happening there? Well, let me go back to the Torah, the first five books of either the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible, the Torah. The fifth book, I'll start with that one, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is where we get programmatically declared, look at chapter 28, for example, if you obey the Lord your God, all will be well with you. All will be well in this world, by the way, We're, there's no afterlife yet. If you obey the Lord your God, you will be prosperous. You will be fertile in your in your family, in your fields, in your animals, and your enemies will flee before you seven ways. Wow, that's, that's in this world. That's kind of checkable, you know. If, we're, if we obey God, everything will go well. Prosperity, fertility, and victory. Conversely, if you disobey God, infertile, no prosperity, and you will flee seven ways before your enemy. Wow, that's pretty perfect. That's almost as, as if our constitution guaranteed us, if you do this, everything will be well. If you don't do this. So that's the book of Deuteronomy. It's the basis for all the history that follows. And it is the basis, of course, when this life sanctions in this life breaks down, that we simply take Deuteronomy into the next life with heaven and hell. And off we go. Now, there is evidence in the Old Testament, forget for the moment anything about the New Testament, that this lovely scenario just ain't working. And this is the scenario today that somebody asks after a terrible tragedy, and there's too many of them on, on the news at the moment for me even to use one, what did we do to deserve this? That's Deuteronomic thinking. What did we do to deserve this? We're being punished. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Now, you mentioned an example. Supposing, for example, you have a very evil king. Now, evil, according to the book of Deuteronomy, that is, they <clears throat> maybe allow other gods besides their own god, makes deals with the countries round about. What about Manasseh? He's considered about as bad a guy as you have in the Old Testament as for kings that everyone knows about. And he lives longer than David. I mean, reigns, reigns longer than David. I've forgotten, 40 years or something. He, how can an evil king reign longer even than David when Deuteronomy says, if you're evil, you get punished. If you're good, you get rewarded. Okay, so Manasseh <laughs> doesn't work on the level of negative sanctions, punishments. And then we have Josiah, one of the best kings in the Bible. He's up there with David. And King Necho of Egypt is coming through him, <laughs> coming through Israel, heading north for the tottering empire. 
and he's he's not attacking Israel. He's just coming through. Excuse me, <laughs> I'm taking my army through. It's probably a bit bad for your crops and things, but I'm coming through. And Josiah decides to go out and oppose him. And he's killed. So now, if you're reading the books of Kings, and you should, you find a good king who dies too young, too soon into his reign, and a bad king who dies too late. So your lovely Deuteronomic theology has two major objections. Now, after the exile, we are rewriting the books of Kings in what we now call the books of Chronicles. We are doing what we call today a cleanup job. We are controlling the narrative, as we say today. Um, well, you might say we're lying too, I suppose, if you want to really get down to it. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to say when we come to Josiah that he was told not to go out against Necho because Necho was on a mission for God. You, you can actually read Chronicles following line by line from Kings, and then all of a sudden you get this new little piece inserted, <laughs> redacted is the polite term for it, and it says that Josiah disobeyed God, that's why he got killed. Our theology works. Comes to Manasseh. We have to clean up Manasseh. So we have the Book of Kings, the Book of Chronicles, you watch the story going down. All of a sudden, Manasseh is taken away to Babylon. And, uh, you know, if he was taken away by the Assyrians, wouldn't he be taken to Asher or Nineveh or Khorsabad or one of the Assyrian cities? Well, okay, forget it. He goes off to Babylon, repents, and God forgives him, and he's home in four verses. I think about four verses, we cleaned him up. Now, I when I say this, I don't want to sound too much like a smart aleck. I, I understand what's going on. These people have gone through the Babylonian exile. They're coming back under Persian sponsorship. They've been told to get their, <laughs> get their country back on its feet again. They're cleaning up their stories. I understand what they're doing. And if I was there with them, I probably would be helping. Because that's what scholars do, to do what's going on at the moment. So I understand it. But these are warnings that this story was not working. And when history and theology don't agree, do you change the history, as we did here with Manasseh and Josiah, or do you change your theology? And of course, the proof that they didn't change their theology is the book of Job. The book of Job disqualifies the book of Deuteronomy. It says it just doesn't work. Here is the holiest person that ever lived. The holiest person that ever, God says it. The holiest person that ever lives. And this person is suffering more than anyone could even imagine. And it has nothing to do with punishment. It has to do with a sort of a contest between God and a person called the Satan, who is like the attorney general in heaven. I think that, that would be his job. He, he, it's a contest between God saying, this is the holiest person that ever lived, and the attorney general, Mr. Satan, saying, yeah, he's just in it for the goodies. He's read the book of Deuteronomy. He knows to be a good guy, and he'll get all the goodies. So now, Take all the goodies away from him and watch him curse you. So God's honor is at stake in this story. And as we know, Job will not curse God. He will not curse God. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't make any sense. So Job is the great challenge to the book of Deuteronomy. And that's where the poet Frost talks about him stultifying. He says, Job stultified the Deuteronomist. Stultus is the Latin word for stupid. It stupefies the Deuteronomy. It proves that Deuteronomy just doesn't work. There's nothing wrong with it, except that it's not right. And what do you think about when the New Testament um, 
claims that Jesus says things like, I have come here to bring not peace, but a sword. I love I love that one, Jacob. Because remember the, remember the book some years ago, Zealot used that as the opening. And if you stop there, I agree with you. If somebody says, I've come to bring a sword, I would think that sounds to me violent. Or I've come to bring a gun. Yeah, it sounds to me violent. But you have to really, you have to really keep going. I've come to bring not peace but the sword. I have come to do what? To set one generation against the other. To set the father against the son, son against the father, mother, daughter, mother in law, daughter in law. You notice it's not to set the father against the mother or to set the brother against the brother or sister. It's a generational split. What Jesus is saying is what I am doing is going to split the generations. The older ones are going to say, eh, no, this is new. We don't do new stuff. This is not old. It's the next generation that will go with me. And he is absolutely right because that's what happens again and again when you, when you have a major shift. It works with computers. It works with everything else. Very often it's the next generation that grows up with it that takes it. So the idea of taking the sword literally, when Jesus goes on to say it divides the mother, well, maybe the mother and the daughter-in-law, <laughs> sword might be a bit literal, but no, I mean, it's, it, it can't be taken literally. If it was just there, honestly, by itself, I'd have to wonder and say, well, how do you explain what other things Jesus said? But this isn't even a valid quotation. It's like quoting the first half of what somebody said. It's not a valid quotation. How does the Q document escalate the rhetorical violence? Okay, maybe should should I kind of explain what the Q document is? Sure. Or would you presume? Okay, sorry if everyone knows this. Sorry for telling you what it is. But, uh, about, starting about 200 years ago, scholars began to notice that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had an awful lot of the same material in the same order. In other words, either we have four independent witnesses of what happened, or we got a bunch of copying going on, or plagiarists, as we might say today. So after every possibility was worked out, scholars finally came to a consensus. Now, consensus doesn't mean that an eminent scholar cannot disagree, of course. But a consensus in scholarship, I consider it to be a miracle, to be honest with you. It happened, happened so seldom. But anyway, the consensus is that the common materials that we find that anyone who reads in parallel columns will notice immediately is that Mark is the source used independently by Matthew and Luke. That's a consensus. Mark is the source used independently by Matthew and Luke. Now, when you line those up in parallel columns, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and by the way, if you're studying the Gospels and you're not studying in parallel columns, you're just having fun. If you're serious, you're dealing in parallel columns and you're reading horizontally. If you read straight through Mark, straight through Matthew, straight through Luke, your mind will just go all fuzzy and everything will merge into the other and you won't even see it. I find this with graduate students. If I ask them to do it, they'd rebel halfway through Matthew. It's the same old stuff. Or it's all parables and miracles. We read all this stuff. Then I would give them it. I'd take pages from a four column and ask them to read horizontally. What's the difference you see? I mightn't get into sources. I just ask to talk about difference. But once people began to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Mark now is the source for Matthew and Luke. So that explains what you might call the triple tradition. They began to notice that there's other stuff in there that's in Matthew, in Luke, and it ain't in Mark. <laughs> and there's too much similarity in the words for it to be just random oral tradition. 
and there's enough similarity, granted the changes that each will make, in the sequence. You, you understand the argument is not just some similarity in words, but in sequence. If, if you had written a novel, say a spy novel, let's say, and you somebody else copied it and changed all the names and all the places, but the plot was exactly the same, the sequence of events. You could make a case in court that the person copied your spy story and just changed the names or something. So we're watching for similarity in content, similarity in sequence. And since the people who invented this <laughs> recognized it, I suppose, rather, were German scholars, they call this the quelle, or I suppose you could say the andere quelle, the other source. After all, Mark was already a source. So this was like a second source, the quelle. They didn't call Mark a source because it was a gospel. I would call this the gospel according to Q, <laughs> if I could the gospel according to the other source besides Mark. That's Q. All right. So Q is what you get when you look through parallel columns and ignore them, the Mark and stuff. Okay. You can see, for example, when does it start with John the Baptist? In Q, in Q, John the Baptist is not too sympathetic to the people coming to be baptized. He calls them all sorts of names and pretty much almost tells them they're going to hell. <laughs> and that he, he, he likens them to trees that are being hewn down with an ax. He likes them to be chaffed as being burned by the fire. The God of Q is, is more violent than the God of Mark. And if you read through Q, you know, you brood of vipers and hypocrites, you're going to hell sort of stuff you get a feeling that the Q community or whoever produced Q, whether it's an individual or a community or whatever, ain't doing too well in this mission business. He really is mad at Capernaum. He's mad at Bethsaida. He's mad at these small little towns of Galilee where Jesus spent most of his time. And clearly, the mission ain't doing as well. There's more people saying, eh, no. Mm -mm -mm. And so, what you do when you're losing, <laughs> when you're losing, maybe in the presidential election, you get mad at people. So he's mad at them, and he invokes God. And the God of Q is much more the punisher than the God of Mark. And it reflects what people are experiencing. If I am being persecuted by you, and I think my God is just, the biblical God we're talking about, then my God's going to get you, if I can't. So wherever you find people losing, which tells me that Paul wasn't losing, and tells me that Mark wasn't losing. It tells me a bit that Matthew was losing, by the way, because Matthew is the one that says, <laughs> won't you, <laughs> scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you're all going to hell. You say, wait a minute, Matthew, wait a minute now. In, in chapter five, you, you had Jesus saying, don't call people names and love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now here we have your, you know, so many chapters later and this same Jesus is now saying, brood of vipers and hypocrites, you're all going to hell. What happened to the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, who changed their mind? Did Jesus change his mind or did you change your Jesus? As you experience more and more opposition, more and more non-compliance, your Jesus got nastier and nastier. Hmm. So it's, it's a symbol of temporary, or at least individual failure, the nastier the rhetoric gets. That tells me that John of Patmos is losing bad, really bad. That those seven churches that he sends all this stuff to, yeah, they might read him, but they ain't heeding him. So watch the rhetoric. The more the sparks fly, 
the more the person experiences their failure. And speaking of hell, what do you think about hell? Does, in some sense, does the New Testament uh, God takes uh, does the New Testament God take things up a notch by saying, "I'm going to throw everybody down in hell that don't believe in me"? Some would say that, in some sense, that would make the New Testament God undoubtedly worse than the Old Testament God. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it has ha it has happened about 150 years before the time of Jesus. I think. The Deuteronomy really runs, <laughs> there are exceptions as we saw, but it runs everything up until I think we can always put a date on it around the year 160 BCE when the Maccabean revolt, what is happening is Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, the, the monarch of the Syrian empire, it's kind of tottering because Egypt is always pushing up from the south and pushing against it coming up through Israel against Syria. And now Rome is coming east, <laughs> step by step, but it's never going back. It's always coming, coming forward. So Antiochus, trying to hold on to his tottering empire, decides to solidify it by making Israel a secure buffer state, economically, politically, religiously, part of the Syrian empire. So he invents something, which I think has never happened in the world before, I think religious persecution. It's not that I, you know, I want you part of my empire and I'll, I'll kill you if you don't go along with it. But Antiochus has decided that the only way to make Israel an economic, social, political part of his empire is to get rid of this weird idea they have of a just God and a just land and everything else. So he persecutes. Now, what are you going to do with Deuteronomy when you're looking at the battered, brutalized body of a martyr? Nobody's going to believe, well, he's been punished for his sins. He's just bravely accepted death rather than betray his heritage, his legacy, his tradition, his God. Deuteronomy died along with the Maccabean martyrs. But wait a minute, it rose again in the next life. Ah. So Deuteronomy was right, but not in this life. There is an afterlife. And that's when God cleans up the mess of the world. Ah. So in one sense, Deuteronomy survived. It was resurrected, you might say, into the next life, into heaven and hell. And eventually, the sanctions are not valid in this life, but they're valid in the next life. And for that, you have two locations, heaven and hell. Now, for me, myself, I'm not talking about myself. I think the idea of heaven and hell as locations in the next life is absurd. It's almost got nothing to do with God. I mean, it's just too stupid for words. But it's terribly, terribly valid for this life. We, and by we, I mean the human race, Homo sapiens, the allegedly wise Homo, is creating heaven and hell and has been doing it ever since our race came out of Africa. 70,000 plus years ago, we've been creating heaven and hell on this earth and trying to live somewhere between them. And at the moment, it looks an awful lot, though I realize people have always said this maybe, it's kind of like hell is winning, that we're, we're kind of making the world unsustainable. So I would say maybe for 2,000 years, could we bracket heaven and hell in the next life? Not even get into arguing about it because I don't want to get, I, I don't want to waste time there, but start focusing on heaven and hell in this life. What we're creating and with no 
way of getting out of it except our possibility to change. We, we can't figure whether we get away with it because God is merciful, God is forgiving. Yeah, but apparently the climate isn't. Apparently it doesn't forgive at all. And apparently it's not merciful. Apparently the only thing we have going for us is that we can change and we have time to change before it's too late. That's what I would like to talk about. Heaven and hell as options in the present. Do you think it's possible that some back then looked at it like that, but eventually it was re it was reimagined as supernatural places? You know, Jacob, there's sometimes, honestly, I sometimes have don't know how to handle, you may have said this when I was talking to you before, I, I live in the post-enlightenment world. When I look back to the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of those people, I don't mean just the, the Jews or the Christians, all of them lived in a pre-enlightenment world. I mean, they're, in the Western world, their great, their great literature was Homer. But Homer's Iliad doesn't even imagine that now and then the gods come down and do miracles. The gods are running the whole show. They're like in charge of the, of the production. So, I mean, when I read Homer, or Virgil, for that matter. I, I keep asking myself, did they take this literally? I mean, how literally did they take Achilles and Paris and the whole bunch of them and the gods? Inter I don't even want to say interfering or intervening even because you don't talk about a boss interfering. A boss is running the show. Or if you imagine the production, uh, you know, the director of a movie, you don't say, well, he intervenes. No, he he runs the operation. That's the way the gods are in, in Homer. They're in charge of the show. Does everyone take that literally? Do we say ordinary people did, but smart Alex scholars didn't? I mean, I think that's condescending. I, I don't know. I don't know until you get to a post-enlightenment say, and you can say, now, are you taking that literally? And then very often they might say to you, well, what do you mean by literal? Do you mean by that, really? Because I think they did take it seriously, at least. I know they took it seriously. I know I think we were a very brave person in the ancient world who said out loud, I don't believe in the gods and I'm not going to worship any of them. I would say, if, if that's what you think, keep your mouth shut and do it some other way that you don't get yourself <laughs> blamed the first time there's a volcano or an avalanche or a forest fire and you're the local guy who said there ain't no gods and they're going to hang you up because <laughs> the gods are mad with you but i don't know how to do it and i'm going to be very frank with you and it's dangerous there's political views in this country at the moment and i live in it and i'm not certain whether to take them literally or not I'm not sure at times whether they're just politi political rhetoric or a sincere belief that somebody has. I, I don't know. And I don't know how to find out because I'm sure if I asked the person, they would say probably get out of my face or go away or something. So I don't know how to ask a pre-enlightenment person. And you can't get around it by people saying to me, well, you don't just don't believe in miracles. You see, the person who says that believes in Christian miracles, but not in Roman miracles or Greek miracles or Jewish miracles. But the first century is a miracle ridden world. <laughs> or if you don't use miracle, you might use wonder or you might use marvels. But nobody in the first century could say, for example, that a given individual could not ascend up to heaven among the gods or to God. They couldn't. It's in all their stories. They might debate whether your guy Caesar or our guy Jesus did. That's fair enough. But you could no more deny that a human being could be taken up and made divine 
then you or I could negate that there's such a thing like Nobel Prizes. We might say somebody got it, somebody didn't get it, but that they exist. So I think we have to go back into that first century world, accept that they consider miracles, marvel, marvels, wonders exist, and then ask, how come they thought Jesus was involved in all of this stuff and not somebody else? And if Caesar Augustus was taken up to God and Jesus the Christ was taken up to God and everyone admits it could happen to both and each of them then is the savior of the world, we only have one world, why do we need two saviors? This sounds a little bit like treason to me. <laughs> so I would think if a Christian went up to Caesar Augustus and said, you do understand your imperial highness, you're just a metaphor or a symbol or a pre-enlightenment mistake, I wouldn't advise them doing that. I think they'd be dead real fast. And I still wouldn't know whether Caesar took it literally that Caesar was divine or not. I am absolutely certain he took it very, very seriously. And you had better do that too, if you're in the first century. Does the New Testament God's punish, punishment uh, aspect, does it seem to get um, greater? Like does this punishment mode get expanded from Paul's letters all the way up to Revelation? Um, well, the, the trouble is, Paul's letters, let's say, are in the 50s. Now, Mark's gospel is in the 70s, okay? I, I don't think you, you, you could get a, a perfect line going. We could certainly argue Paul. Paul is much more interested in telling you about the good stuff than he is with banging you over the head. I mean, Paul very seldom says, look, the parousia is coming soon. You better get with it because you're going to get it. He's much more telling you about the great feast and celebration and get with it and get ready for it. He, I mean, of course it's there. Paul probably takes it for granted there's a hell and everything else. But that's not the major fire and brimstone core of his teaching as it is with John. If you look at Mark, okay, Paul is in the 50s. Well, that's about the same time as the Q document. And the Q document is a written document. And it's around the same time, the 50s, the 60s. I think the surest thing I would say is that it's before the war of 66 to 74, because I can't see a hint of that in there. So I'm certain about before the 60s, I mean, I'd say the 50s, the same time as Paul for that reason. So they're both coming from the 50s, let's say. Mark is the 70s. That's, an, again, fairly certain because he pretty much describes the war in chapter 13 and the failure of the expectation in chapter 13 that Christ will really come. Now, you know, uh, Jerusalem is being burned to the ground, the Romans are here, now Christ is going to come. Of course he didn't. So in one sense, Mark is a gospel for, for the disappointed. Uh, Matthew, I think in general, it's, it's, it's a good argument that it's maybe from the 80s. It's not as sure as Mark. Luke, Luke is wide open. Luke could be any time from the 80s to the 120s, especially if you think of Luke Acts as a single composite two volume work. I put it well into the beginning of the second century. And on the other hand, I think the 90s is a good time for the gospel, uh, for the um, book of Revelation. I think that's a consensus of scholarship and it works very well for everything I can see. So it's more like a, you know, like a heartbeat. <laughs> if the up, up part of it is the uh, the non-violent, violent, non-violent, violent. Non -violent, violent. It's, it's a backwards and forwards rather than a nice, clear God getting worse or worse or worse or worse. And again, if you begin with the very, very first part of the Bible, I think when the Bible, 
I'm talking about the Hebrew scriptures, as I understand it, when they were being assembled in their first composite official in under the Persians, when the Persians sent them back after the Babylonian exile and told them, get your city rebuilt, get your laws set up and everything else. This was their laws. I think when they were assembled, what we call Genesis 1, the first kind of creation, was put up front to be the prologue, preface, introduction to the whole Bible. And I think to negate the book of Deuteronomy, which is the last one of the five. Because there's nothing in the book of Genesis about human beings are made in God's image. And if they disobey, they'll be punished. There's nothing about punishment in the first account of creation. What if people refuse their, their destiny to be in the image and likeness of God and in charge of God's creation? What if we blow it? Where's the punishment? Where's the sanctions? There's not a glimpse of that in the first account of creation. So I think it's put up there to say, human beings, you are made in God's image and likeness. Act like it, because that's your destiny. That's your identity. And I don't have to mention any punishments because it's not about punishments. It's about you have to live according to your destiny and your identity. If you don't understand this, Genesis 1 might say, go up to a high building and think you're a bird and see what happens. You can't live against your identity or your destiny. So I think the first book of the five is a counterpoint to the fifth book of the five in the Torah. And that's the first book of the Bible. So if I look at the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible, I'm talking now the Christian Bible, and I have to choose one, the first book is so far superior that it seems to me it's going this way. It's going downhill. And what a Jesus and a Paul are trying to do is get back to that opening chapter against the drag of normalcy. So it... it it doesn't work like a nice linear going up, going down. <laughs> so what was Tertullian's problem with the acts of Paul and Thecla? Okay, now we're moving. Um, well, his problem, and we're talking about the year, maybe in round numbers, 2000, there is a document called the Acts of Paul. And this document dates, maybe I'd say around the year 175. It incorporates, well, somebody incorporated into it an opening section, which we now call the Acts of Tecla. Tecla is a female apostle and she is with Paul, but Paul's a kind of a wimp in terms of Tecla. She's really the heroine of the story and takes off all by herself. Tertullian's problem is that she not only baptizes, but she baptizes herself. Paul refuses to baptize her because he said, although she has already withstood the arena and been miraculously saved from fire by hailstones, he says, maybe the next time you might give in. So he won't baptize her, which is <laughs> unspeakable. He won't baptize her. So the next time when she is put into the arena against uh, <laughs> against the lioness, by the way, which 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 is early Christian femaleism, because the lioness protects her against a lion, <laughs> female against male. Anyway, she baptizes herself. There's a big vat there with murderous sea creatures, I suppose, lamprey eels or something like that in there. She jumps in and baptizes herself. She baptizes herself because the guy, the male guy, Paul, won't baptize her. Now, <laughs> Tertullian, who's trying to run, you know, a bishop freak and all the rest of it, where only bishops and priests do the baptizing. And there you have a woman saying, not only will I baptize others, I can baptize myself if you guys won't. 
that's no way to run a church. So if we won't baptize, excuse me, if we won't ordain women, maybe they'll ordain themselves or something. So his problem is that he says, and he's quite right, Paul did not write the Acts of Paul. Of course he didn't. Duh. <laughs> None of the apocryphal Acts, Acts of John, Acts of Thomas, Acts of Peter, none of them were written by the people who wrote them. And the Acts of the Apostles weren't written by Peter and Paul. So they are the Acts about, not by Acts about, anyway. So that's his point. But the other, the second point is not only did Paul not write this, but women, he says, and presumably this is in Africa or Asia Minor, are using Tekla to argue that they have a right to teach and baptize. And then his argument is, how could Paul possibly have written the Acts of Paul saying that women could baptize since he is against that himself? So basically what we're dealing with is that apparently there is this woman Tekla, and it's a controversial, is she a historical figure about whom legends have grown, but she was known all over the Mediterranean world. She was more important than Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. I think of the, say if, if, you, if you were looking at the year 150 at least, we, we have her in from, Spain to Syria, basically. Uh, my, my wife, Sarah, and I visited her shrines in Tarragona, in Spain, and in Malula, in Syria, all across the Mediterranean. And clearly, she's an inspiration for women. I'm not saying she's an, not an inspiration for men, but she certainly is an inspiration for women. And whether she exists or is an inspired creation, she is clearly, that's Tertullian, <laughs> horrifying to say women are using her as claiming the right to teach and baptize. Now, he wouldn't get angry if they weren't doing that. So this tells me, of course, and this is why it's so important for me then to say, you know, if there's women today, feminist scholars, we're asking, is Paul good for women or not? I would say, well, at least check out what was happening in the second century when Tekla and Tekla women, <laughs> let me say, looked at Paul and said, in effect, nah, this we can use. Yeah, there's stuff here probably we won't, but there's stuff here we can use. And do the pseudo Paulines at all try to modify the way Paul views um, God's punishment and wrathfulness? Um, well, not much. I mean, I think the big difference between the, the if you look at any of what are called the, the apocryphal acts of the apostles, that would be the acts of Peter, the acts of Paul, the acts of Thomas, the acts of John, who am I missing somebody else? There's five main ones. The main issue is all of them are claiming in one way or another that basically the only true Christian or the really best Christian is a ascetic celibate. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says quite clearly that he himself is an ascetic celibate. He's like maybe the Essenes down at Qumran or some of the Essenes that were possibly in Egypt. He is an ascetic celibate. That is not <laughs> that he is witnessing against the world. The, the normalcy of the world, of course, is to get married and have children. But the norm, normalcy of the world is also to have wars and everything else. So one way to witness against this world in the most staggeringly, stunning way possible is to opt out of it. I mean, if everyone did it, it would be the end of the world, right? I wouldn't worry about that happening, by the way. But it's a witness. It's a witness that the normalcy of creation, the normalcy of civilization, ain't the inevitability of human nature. So it's a witness. But Paul says quite explicitly, yes, I think 
it would be good if all of you were like me. It's not a great argument. He said, you have more time for God. I spent 19 years in the monastery. Did I have more time for God? <laughs> it's a moot question for me. Um, that's what Paul says, but he doesn't say, in fact, he says the opposite. I will not demand it. Everyone has their own gift. So marriage, of course. Now, in the second century and the third century and the fourth century, and especially after martyrdom stopped as being a phenomenon, say after Constantine in the fourth century, the idea of witness against the world, which is what celibate asceticism is, became more and more popular. And you find it in the Acts of Peter, and Tekla, of course, Tekla. And that's what you'd have to ask if a woman in that culture was passed eventually, possibly at the age of 13 or 14, by the way, from the power of her husband, from the power of her father to the power of a husband. And all of a sudden they see a vision of maybe a women's community living celibate lives run by women for women of women that might look very, very attractive. The fact that it might look attractive possibly to women, other times that's a separate issue, but it could look, I'm not saying it could, it must have looked attractive because it happened. So that's something that is especially in the second century and third century and fourth century. And then there's a debate. Is the celibate better than the married person? Is the married person better than the celibate? Are they both equal? Are they like this? Are they like in <laughs> the elite core of the community? So all of that's the discussion of the second, third and fourth century. It's not really much the discussion of the first century. Paul, Paul's willing to say, I think it'd be good if you're like me, but he's not willing to say you'd be better if you were like and I don't think he's willing to tell, to tell, say, um, his married converts that, well, I'm better than you people. I, I don't think, I don't think he thinks that. He thinks they're co-workers with him on the same level. And in my closing question, how does one deal with the problem of the Christian Bible? That is that God is portrayed as both, it's God is both portrayed as violent and nonviolent, and the same issue is true of Christ. Well, I think the answer, to be honest with you, is very clear. The first thing I think you should do, just what you said, you should admit they're both there. I can give you all the good God and all the bad God, whichever. But I think in the Christian Bible, listen to what I just called it, the Christian Bible. That's the name of Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. We never call ourselves biblicists. We call ourselves Christians. We, we could have called ourselves Biblists or something like that. The norm of the Bible is Jesus. I think when um, Evangelicals said, what would Jesus do? WWJD, they got it absolutely right. They didn't say WWJD. BS, I'm sorry, I'm no point intended. What would the Bible say? They could have said, what would the Bible say? Why not? But if they go to the Bible, they know exactly what they're going to find. You want a violent God to justify your violence? I'll give it to you. You want a nonviolent God to justify your nonviolence? It's there. The norm of the Bible, as I understand it, for Christians, is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, not the Christ of the book of Revelation, Jesus of Nazareth, who rode into Jerusalem on that peace donkey and who gave us the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is the norm of the Bible. What would Jesus do? I would say to our Muslim, Muslim friends, Muslim colleagues, we are really not the people of the book. We are the people of the person. Jesus is the norm of the book. That's why every time you find those magnificent images all over Eastern Christianity of Jesus holding the book, 
He's never reading it. <laughs> the book is either closed in his arms or it's open to us. And the book, if it's open to us, and you can read the Greek on there, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That ain't the book talking. That's the book quoting Jesus. So look at all those Pantocrator images, as we call them, and see if you can find me a place where Jesus is reading the book and saying, nah, I don't think so. Mm, no, that's not me. The book's for us. It's about Jesus, of course. And it's an honest book because it tells us what Jesus says. It tells us we really don't like it. Just watch us change it. That's what's precious about the Bible. It's an honest to God book. It shows us both taking the vision and then subverting it, taking it again, subverting it again, taking it again, and subverting it. That's us. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dom. Always a pleasure, Jacob. Thank you very, very much for having me. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.